Hi, I'm Claire. And I'm Isaac. And we are coming into land with episode five of Meet Extreme Switching. The last one. The last one. So what have we got coming up? Oh, we're going to be talking about a number of uh, acronyms that stand for technologies like VRRP. We're going to be looking at VPEX, Extended Edge. We're going to be looking at Video Audio Bridging, AVB. Yeah, there's a few, there's a, there's there's a few a of those. <laughs> and then we get into um, just showing our viewers what, um, what it looks like to manage a switch from a command line, the types of commands, right? It can get scary, can feel scary, but we'll go through a number of the most often used commands on a day-to-day -day basis, and we'll just explain them. We actually go through them, and we explain exactly what they mean. You'll watch them and go like, wow, oh, okay, that's not that difficult. We, so, we've had someone do, the, do them in real life for us, haven't we? So we'll really talk you through, like you'll see the command line, which I thought was really interesting. There we go. And then I think we're going to come into land uh, with talking about extreme switching and the big picture and how, yeah, how it can just, I guess, enhance your uh, network, right? Exactly. And then you're going to finish off with the telling our users about the exam, The right? exam, yeah. I mean, if you want to certify, you guys know the drill. Just, uh, yeah, hold on till the end and I will be there to talk you through the steps on, on how to certify. That's all we've got, I think. Yep. Let's go. Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. Like any good networking company, Extreme Networks also has a bucket of acronyms that we use and throw around all the time. And we're gonna cover those in this section. VPEX, VPEX, which is Virtual Port Extender. I like to think of it as extended edge, as the ability to get really close up to where your users are located. But as you can see in this photo on screen, this thing looks like a switch, it smells like a switch, it tastes like a switch, but it isn't a switch. It's a brainless device. All it does is it passes data from the port back up to a controller and then that controller sends the data back to where it needs to go. So in essence, port one on this device cannot talk to port two on this device internally. It actually has to proxy all that traffic back and then come back from the controller to port two. This is the device. It's like you have taken a switch and taken out the brains of that switch and then extended it pushed it out closer to where the users are. That is VPEX. The next acronym that you'll see on some of our documentation is AVB, which stands for Audio Video Bridging. And this technology is a standards-based, IEEE standards-based technology and used in the entertainment industry, or that's where it's used a lot. The idea behind this is if you've ever been to a rock concert, one of the things that you'll see if you, if, you, if you come early is you'll see a ton of cabling going from the stage to the, to the midway mixing desk and then to the main mixing desk of every uh, musical instrument, every microphone on stage. All of these require their own individual cases. And I know that nowadays a lot of the microphones are cordless, but at the end of the day, there's a cable going somewhere. All of those cables can be converted. All of those cables are carrying audio data and many times video data as well. But all of that data can be carried over an ethernet cable. But you need certain standards and you need certain protocols and technologies to actually enable that to work. And AVB is the answer. What AVB does, is it reserves 75% of the available bandwidth on an Ethernet port for audio and video synchronization, meaning that any other extraneous traffic that is, uh, that is on that network is given a very, very low priority, only 25%. And it uses a pulse mechanism that triggers uh, every eight Hertz, and that sends these uh, all the audio and video data in perfect synchronicity. And this is the future 
of audio video in rock concerts, in music, in the entertainment industry. Extreme switches support this technology out the box. The next acronym, QOS, quality of service. So what are we trying to do with quality of service? In essence, we want to prioritize certain types of traffic. For example, we might prioritize traffic that is carrying voice data or video data. Or perhaps we want to prioritize another type of data, maybe security protocol data. We can do this. Exos allows us to have various prioritization levels and we apply that at the edge of the network and it can run and carry that prioritization through VLANs and everywhere else that that data is going to travel. An important thing to understand about Quas though is it only kicks in when there is congestion on the network. So you don't just say, I want this data to be prioritized. That will not happen. It will only be prioritized when there is congestion, at which point it puts the rest of the data into a queue. The way I understand it, and I think I can explain it, is imagine if you had the prioritization of something like Skype traffic. You wanted that to get maximum prioritization. It would mean when the data arrived at the switch, the switch would let all that data packets flow. But other data that is not Skype would be put in a queue and maybe once every eight packets, it would let that data f flow. So it would still get through, but not with the same level of prioritization. That is quality of service in a network. VRRP stands for Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. Think of a LAN that has a connection, a router that gets you out onto the internet. If that router were to go down, you lose the ability of those users to connect out. So one of the things that you can do is you can have uh, a, this virtual router redundancy protocol, which will basically redirect traffic to the internet based on which switch uh, you have configured. So in this diagram you see on screen, you'll see a user computer, and you'll see two gateways to get out onto the internet. Only one of those gateways is actually active. The second one is passive. It's sitting there and it's waiting. And if there is a failure on the first gateway, then the traffic will automatically flow to the second gateway so that it can get out to the internet. The second part of VRRP is when you use it as load balancing technology. If you take a look at the screen, you'll see this diagram where you have multiple users connecting to one gateway and multiple users connecting to, a, uh, to another gateway. And each of those groups goes to their assigned gateways. But there is this load balancing where you connect these gateways in the manner that you see on screen. And if one of them fails, if one of those gateway fails, all the users on the right-hand side would be automatically sent to the left-hand side gateway. And the same thing happens for the other one. Of course, if there's also too much traffic going through the one, the load balancing can kick in and take some users off and put them to the opposite gateway to help spread the load amongst those gateways. Virtual router redundancy protocol. In this module, we're going to talk a little bit about the way the language that you use to address an Exos or switch engine switch. Most people who are used to working in other vendors' uh, systems, when they come across, they find some difficulties. And that is because the way we do things is different to most approaches. It basically starts by us creating VLANs. Everything starts from the creation of the VLAN process. Then comes the idea of adding ports into VLANs. And a lot of our competitors do it the other way around. They take ports and they attach those to VLANs. If you can get that in your head, if you can understand that philosophy, first VLANs, then ports, then 
managing and, and accessing our switches is going to become a lot easier. If I use the command show VLAN, you can see that there are currently two VLANs running on the switch, a default VLAN and a management VLAN. By default, we mean every port on the switch is assigned to the default VLAN and the management VLAN is there for out-of-band management only. So let's look at the default VLAN in a little bit more detail. To do this, I would type show VLAN default. Remember, uppercase letters and lowercase letters are important. It now shows more detailed information. As you can see, this VLAN has got a tag of one, and it also shows all the ports are inactive. This is a 16-port switch where all ports are untagged. We use the show command to set the current configuration on that switch. Let's move on now to create a VLAN. Type create VLAN red. Red is simply a name I'm going to give it. it. It could literally be almost anything you want. I could have called it HR or engineering, etc. The show VLAN command confirms that a VLAN named red has now been created. Why do we create VLANs? Mostly to separate network traffic within our network. A new red VLAN currently has a tag or identifier of one, but we want to change that tag to a tag value of 200. How do we do that? By typing configure VLAN red tag 200. The syntax is really logical. So let's see the results by using the show VLAN command again. There you have it. The VLAN 200 tag is now on the red VLAN. Next up, we're going to add one of those 16 ports to the red VLAN. Let's choose port number 10. Configure VLAN red add port 10. So what happens now is the system has removed port 10 from the default VLAN and placed it into the red VLAN. We can see this in more detail if I use the show VLAN red command. It's got the tag of 200 and also port 10, which is now untagged and sitting in the red VLAN. If we go back to the default VLAN by typing show VLAN default, remember your uppercase D, you can see I've got port 9 and port 11, but port 10 is no longer there because it belongs to the VLAN. Let's repeat the process, but this time add a tag port, port 11, to the red VLAN. We'll use the configure VLAN red add port 11 tagged command. Show VLAN red confirms we now have an untagged port 10 and a tagged port 11 in the red VLAN. Why would we tag a port? Well, it allows us to pass traffic for multiple VLANs, whereas an untagged port will only pass traffic for a single VLAN. Now let me show you how you add an IP interface to that red VLAN. Configure VLAN red IP address 192.168.1.1 slash 24. This, this is just an example address. Here's confirmation the interface has been created. And if we do the show VLAN red command again, we can see that it's now got that assigned IP address. Why do we do this? We do this so that we can route traffic on this VLAN. Finally, let's show you how to add a user to the switch. We start by running the show accounts command. And as you can see, there are already user accounts on the switch, but we now want to create a completely new one. Uh, it's create account user joe password. The create account bit is the command used to create the account. The user tells the switch what type of account it is, uh, which could be admin, for example. Then joe is the username we use to log into the switch. 
and password is actually the password we have now assigned to this user. Show accounts confirms the account has now been created. If I then log out of my current session, it asks whether I want to save the configuration, and obviously, yes, yes I do. The configuration gets saved, and now I'm logged out of the admin account. Next, to test that everything is working properly, I'm going to log back in as Joe with the password, password. There you go. You can see the prompt has now changed from a hash, which meant that I was logged in as the administrator account, to the Chevron prompt, which denotes I'm now logged in as a read-only account. Now, why would you do this? Why would you create user accounts on the switch? Well, one of the main reasons is for security purposes. You really don't want anyone accessing the switch to have administrator access, which means that they could literally change absolutely anything on the configuration. So the big picture, extreme switching is going to help you in an enterprise to go from the edge into the aggregation layer, into the core, into the data center. This huge amount of scalability from a small enterprise to a massive business. Extreme switching powers, it's the backbone of the infinite enterprise. As we come into land, I want to thank you for spending this time watching this series. I've certainly enjoyed teaching it, and I hope you've learned something new about extreme networks and about extreme switching. Stay tuned for more information on the exam. Claire, take it away. Thanks so much, Isaac. And if you guys just bear with me a few more moments, I'll be taking you through how to create yourself a portal account and access the certification exam. So to create yourself an Extreme Portal account, you just need to take yourself to extrememetworks.com. From the right-hand side of the page, you can then click Support Portal. Again, from the right-hand side of this page, you'll see a Login or Sign Up button. So click that, which will take you to Login or Sign Up. If you need to sign up, complete the registration details and you should receive a confirmation email back relatively shortly. And that's it. Once you've created yourself a portal account, you can use these credentials to access the community from the website, documentation, and also the dojo, which is where you get to the exam.